We are joined today by Noam Chomsky and Vijay Prashad to talk about their book, The Withdrawal, Iraq, Libya, Afghanistan, and the Fragility of U.S. Power. I wanted to talk about a term that you guys use in your discussion, which is military Keynesianism. And I'd like you to speak about what that is because there's this aha moment, I think, that happens when you're describing this um, sort of strategy. And it's similar to a conversation I had with a friend of mine who's a public school teacher, and she was talking about how she's scared to teach because of school shootings and the absurd, sadistic, and bizarre uh, Republican um I guess, suggestions that we arm teachers. And I think in Ohio, there was a cap on training teachers to use guns so they could get 24 hours of training and that's it. Um, But I said, well, this, this, it's not hypocritical because the Republican party may claim to care about children, but what they care about the most is dismantling the public school system in America. And what better way to do that than fill it with guns and keep it violent and terrifying. And I think when you pull back from hypocrisy, you find something that makes it cohesive. It's like you said earlier, Noam, it's not that these strategies are irrational. It's not that they're wasteful even. It's just that we haven't put our finger on what the overarching goal is. And I think that your discussion of military Keynesianism does this we hear over and over that the United States military has a bloated, massive budget. We have bases all over the world. You have described efforts to stymie nuclear weapons treaties, which seems absurd to any person who cares about their lives or the lives of others. Um, this, for me, felt like a overarching way of understanding some of those actions. Can you talk about that term? Well, I think there several factors involved in what you described. Uh, One of them is destroying the public education system. That's very significant. Uh, Mass public education back in the late 19th, early 20th century was one of the major contributions that the United States made to general democracy. The United States pioneered mass public education Made, it had plenty of flaws. So, for example, the, the college system, mass public education at the college level, uh, that was made possible simply by uh, genocidal destruction of the indigenous population and stealing their lands. A little footnote in the background for the great state universities. But now, the, putting that little footnote aside, establishing state universities and a kindergarten uh, educational system was a major contribution to democracy. It's hated by the business world. Why? It's, first of all, they don't want uh, anything out of their control. And then it gives people the wrong ideas. It gives them the idea that you can get together through the uh, public system and do things that are good. You don't want people to have that idea. The idea that must be in people's heads is the only thing that can do anything good is private tyrannies. That's what a corporation is. Private tyranny controlled from above, unaccountable to the population. That's called libertarian in the United States. Interesting term. But we have to have the country run by unaccountable private tyrannies, okay? So the idea that the public can do anything decent is very dangerous. So let's kill public education, kill the post office, uh, kill uh, public transportation. Uh, uh, There's a way of doing this, a standard way. What you do is first defund them. Defund them so they don't work, then people get upset. They'll agree to have something else. So when Margaret Thatcher wanted to destroy the British railway system, defunded, start getting accidents, trains don't run on time, say, let's do something else, uh, sell it to somebody who can make profit from it, then it'll be worse. Okay, That happens over and over. So for the last 40 years, last 40 years have been an interesting period 
it's called the neoliberal period. And neoliberalism has all kind of fancy words like let the market reign and so on. It's nonsense. Neoliberalism is a bitter, brutal class war, conscious class war to destroy the general population, place them under the control of private power. If you use the market, no market, doesn't matter. Any technical work. One of the aspects of this is destroy public education. So it's been defunded from the lowest level to the top. You can read an article today about how at the college level, uh, academics and scientists are just pulling out. They're refusing to take the jobs because they're not worth it. They can make more in private industry. They're subject to tons of bureaucracy. They're, they don't get pensions. Why bother? Well, that's part of the system. Why should there be any public system that people benefit from? It's kind of the same as defunding the post office. Why should there be an effective system that works very well for everyone and is under public control? Uh, so getting rid of education is part of that. Uh, the, uh, the business of arming teachers is, I mean, you may have seen a, a joke somewhere about a teacher being prepared to teach kindergarten by uh, having a training in how to shoot a gun, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, let's let's make them hostile places. You ask Ted Cruz, what should we done about schools? More barricades, uh, more guns, uh, police at the door. Wonderful environment for kindergarten students. Uh, but let's let's have it, then we'll control them. So as far as military Keynesianism is concerned, you have to look at that quite carefully. Everyone is heard of Eisenhower's speech, military industrial complex. Industrial is not a small part of it. In the 1950s and the 1960s, the United States had something we're supposed to oppose. It's called industrial policy, state industrial policy to develop the economy. That's, we're supposed to condemn that when China does it. That's why we have what we're now using, computers, uh, internet, uh, satellites, uh, almost all of it came out of the state system through the Pentagon. Pentagon is the way you can get money out of Congress without them making a fuss about it. And so you want to build an internet, let's call it the uh, uh, defense of something or other. You want to build the interstate highway system, uh, back in the 50s, let's call it the defense highway system, then Congress will pay for it. Uh, a large part of the modern economy, high-tech economy, comes from large-scale state intervention uh, through the research universities, government laboratories, and so on. That goes up to the present. I mean, take the Moderna vaccine. Comes mostly from research in the public system hand it over to private corporations so you get a couple of billionaires out of it. That's the way the system does. So when we talk about military Keynesianism, we should recognize that this is part of the way in which the corporate system uses the state for their own benefit, sometimes producing things which are useful, sometimes not. That's irrelevant. They're mainly for profit. So the whole military Keynesian thing is a complex story. You know, just to uh, come into that complex story a little bit, um, one of the historical and theoretical features of capitalism is that the system is very rarely in equilibrium. Um, you know, there are often periods of great growth and then there are periods of great collapse. You know, people later tried to justify this analyzing the historical data and saying there are business cycles, you know, as if to say it's a normal thing that there is a collapse. Well, when you look at a business cycle, a collapse can mean the deterioration of livelihood for very large numbers of people. So one shouldn't be cavalier about that. What is generally called Keynesianism 
is the belief that in a time of the business cycle downward movement, you know, from the trough, the 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 peak downward, um, governments can enter because private capital, what Noam called the uh, private tyranny, is unable to actually invest at a time of downward, uh, you know, uh, uh, when the economy is going downhill. They don't want to invest then because they are also feeling insecure. They generally keep their money outside or they invest in things that are secure. At the time, people like Keynes, not only Keynes, but people like Keynes, um, others as well, argued that governments need to intervene and invest in a counter cyclical fashion. That is to say, invest against the cycle. So when the economy is going downhill, governments can come in and they can put money into infrastructure spending. That, for instance, is exactly what the New Deal was. The New Deal, the spending on bridges and so on in the United States, was a form of counter cyclical spending. In fact, Paul Sweezy and others, you know, uh, very good technical economists actually looked at a long period of data in the United States and they suggested that most counter cyclical spending in the US was not on the social side of the budget. In other words, it was not on expenditure for public education, you know, improving, you know, roofs in schools and raising fee, uh, the pensions of the teachers and so on. It wasn't to build bridges. It wasn't to build public rail. It wasn't to build public goods, actually, is what Sweezy and others found. Um, because the building of public goods is a key part of government spending. What they found was that the bulk of counter cyclical spending was actually in the military side. Now, by 2022, you don't actually need to do a major study, longitudinal study of US government spending. We know that an enormous obscene part of the US budget goes towards the military. We say 700 billion, but it's actually closer to a trillion dollars because you have to add in the parts of the US budget that goes to the Department of Energy, which manages the maintenance of nuclear weapons and so on. It's closer to a trillion dollars if you add in the CIA budget, which we don't know, the National Security Agency budget, which we don't know, and so on. So this counter cyclical spending done on the military side is generally known as military Keynesianism. Um, now, why no one has answered the question, but I want to just emphasize it. Why has the United States set apart from, say, Sweden? And I'm not a big champion of the Swedish system, but you can actually compare the two. In Sweden, there's a lot of counter cyclical spending, but it happens on the social side of the of the ledger. Why in the United States does it happen on the military side? It's a good question to actually ask mainstream political scientists. It's a good question to ask politicians and so on. The one answer that should be on the table, and actually there's enough evidence, published evidence from high officials of the United States government to um, validate this answer. One answer is that when you build the public goods sector, the social wages, you know, you improve public schools, you create public transportation, you build a public health system, you build universal, uh, universally free higher education, you build creches for young children, you know, prior preschools and so on, all of this in the public domain. If you do all that, you give people a taste of socialism. Uh, you give people a real taste of socialism. Because also, people who are elites are sending their children to school or using the same hospitals as working people. So now you don't want to see these facilities deteriorate. You see, if the elite abdicates from public goods, if the elite sends their children to private school, use private hospital, use private transportation, then the elite is not going to care if public goods are in really bad shape. So when everybody is put in the same boat, you start getting a taste of socialism. It looks like from whatever scattered statements exist in the public domain, it looks like in the United States, 
there was almost a decision, particularly after the New Deal, to no longer do massive public spending on the social side as part of the counter cyclical, the normal counter cyclical policy. Instead, the US government actually balances economic turbulence by spending on the military. And that's why I believe that US military spending is actually quite rational. Uh, if you accept the premises of the US ruling elite who don't want to create, use this massive social wealth to create a public good. In fact, in the United States, you could stop, you could cut your military budget by half and you would still have a larger military than anybody around the planet. Then you can put some of that social wealth towards bringing down your debt, towards creating social goods that improve the lives of people who live inside the United States. But no, that's out of the question. And again, not to belabor this, again, this is a decision of the Godfather. Who are you going to question? You can't ask them to change their mind. They've got a settled opinion. There's no space either. Of course, no space with the Republican Party. But where's the space and with the Democratic and, Party to have this conversation? Just to add that what Vijay just described was in fact discussed quite publicly and openly in the business press in the late 1940s. If you read Business Week, uh, other journals, they understood that we're going to have to have some kind of counter cyclic spending. And they concluded that it could be social spending, could be military spending, they'd both work. But the social spending has a downside. And it's pretty much what Vijay just described. And they didn't use the word socialism. They said democracy. And they said public spending people care about. If you're going to build a mass transportation system, people have opinions, should be here, not there. Uh, if you say, I'm building jet planes, nobody has an opinion. Uh, of course, the military experts do it. So we want to do the kind of spending in which the public is out of it. The public doesn't participate. They just listen. That, in fact, is liberal democratic theory. The public are spectators. They don't participate. So you don't want to have the kinds of policies in which people will automatically participate become active politically, become agents, uh, want to determine what's done and so on. That's completely wrong. People are supposed to be in the workplace following orders and push a button every once in a while. It's called an election, but nothing else. So therefore, the military, they said, is a much better option. Now, military, remember, doesn't just mean military. It's not just Lockheed. It's also General Motors, General Electric. In fact, a large part of the industrial system is involved in military production. So there's profit across the board. And nobody's asking about it because it's all for defense against some horrible monster who's about to destroy us. And so this has to go side by side with concocting enormous monsters ready to destroy us tomorrow. You know? But uh, it does fit together as a reasonable ruling class strategy. If you like this video from The Jacobin Show, please hit like and subscribe and share with your friends. Thanks.